Welcome back. My name is Kevin Tokoff on Catalyst University. In this video, we're going to discuss omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids and do a comparison of them side by side and see can we make omega-6 fatty acids, can we make omega-3s, or are there some that we have to get through the diet? I will just preface this with the answer so that you know where we're going. Omega-6 fatty acids are very easy for humans to synthesize de novo. Um, and we actually, if you go back to the, one of the previous videos I showed you right here, this is a reaction scheme where we can start with linoleoyl coa from the diet, and we can pretty easily synthesize arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. Very easy to synthesize for us. Omega-3s, on the other hand, we have a lot harder time doing that. In some cases, we cannot even do it at all. Let's start down here on the left figure, linoleic acid, linoleate, or it's put here. Over here on the left side, these tend to be omega-3s. In fact, alpha-linolenate, this fatty acid, is an omega-3 fatty acid. Over here on the right side, these are toward omega-6, or pro-inflammatory amino uh, fatty acids. An example is arachidonic acid here. You see that these desaturations between them the one going to the left, the omega-3s, this is only a plant desaturase. We cannot do that transformation. That actually makes alpha-linolenic acid, right here in my mouse's, an essential fatty acid. This fatty acid we cannot make. We have to get it through the diet. Okay? However, on the right side, this desaturase, we can do this one. This was actually the scheme that I showed you right here. But sure enough, yeah, we can do this transformation, and that will lead us ultimately to arachidonic acid. So this one figure shows you, yes, we can synthesize omega-6s much easier than omega-3s. We generally have to get omega-3s such as EPA and DHA through the diet. Let's look at another schematic here. Here is linoleic acid right here. Now, this is a little bit, little bit misleading, but linoleic acid can be converted to gamma linoleic acid. That's actually this transformation on the right, right here. We can do this, and then we can do elongation, another desaturation, and we've got arachidonic acid. And recall, arachidonic acid can be sent, uh, made into eicosanoids, which in general, the vast majority of those, promote inflammation. Recall that eicosanoids fall in three general groups, although there are a few more that are not as well talked about. Those three groups are prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. And I said there's a few others. We'll talk about those in a later video. Now, in terms of omega-3s, this transformation from linoleate going to the right, this would be alpha-linoleate. And you see we cannot do this. This is an omega-3 fatty acid designated by the N3 at the end of its name. We cannot do this transformation. It is plants only. So we are forced to get alpha-linoleic acid through the diet. Now, alpha-linoleic acid, if we get it through the diet, can be processed in this long metabolic pathway. So you see we have 18 colon 4 N3 and so on and so forth. This one that I circled or boxed in blue, this is an important one. This is actually EPA. This is eicosapentaenoic acid. This is one of the two major anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids. So you can see we can synthesize it if we have the precursor, but then that precursor, uh, alpha-linoleic acid, is essential. We have to get it through the diet. So either way, if we're talking about alpha-linoleic acid or EPA, we have to get it through the diet. And I think you'll know where this is going. If I follow this down, I go into a peroxisome and then out, and I have DHA. Again, apparently we can synthesize DHA, but only backtracking from an essential fatty acid, this omega-3 alpha-linoleic acid, which I don't have labeled here, but that's uh, this fatty acid right here. So what's the point? Omega-6 fatty acids we can make. Um, in you do need them to live. You have to have omega-6s like arachidonic acid to live. But we should try to minimize those in the diet as much as possible. Unfortunately, in the standard American diet, it is much higher in omega-6 fatty acids, which tend to promote inflammation. But we don't need as much as we intake because we can make them. However, omega-3 fatty acids, as you can see, and hopefully as I've explained, we really can't make those. 
The initial desaturations and transformations are done in plants only. So we have to rely on either getting DHA directly, EPA directly, or getting enough alpha-linolenic acid to make these biotransformations to EPA and then ultimately down here to DHA. Okay? So there is a point in this. Um, I'll go back to this slide initially. You can take a DHA supplement. I would highly recommend this. I'm not actually trying to sell a product here necessarily, but I do care about people's health and DHA and EPA, but particularly this DHA. Uh, this is the major one of the two that's very anti-inflammatory. This is very good to take, typically because in the United States and many other Western societies, we have a diet that is much higher in omega-6 fatty acids. This theory is actually um, part of the uh, reasoning behind something like the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is much higher in seafood, and those kind of uh, animal products have a tendency to have a lot more omega-3s. In fact, a quick literature search or internet search, you can see that Atlantic salmon and shrimp have a lot more omega-3 fatty acids than a lot of other foods do. Um, and it turns out that DHA and EPA, which are the two main um, anti-inflammatory fatty acids, um, they're really mainly found in some animal products like shrimp and fish. In fact, uh, they've shown that vegans and vegetarians tend to have uh, quite a bit less DHA and EPA in their diet, um, mainly because if they are eliminating foods like these, they're not getting adequate intake of the DHA. Um, on the... On the flip side, though, um, the, uh, vegan and vegetarian diets are also, they have less omega-6s. So if you are someone who's following a standard American diet, eating McDonald's, that kind of unhealthy food, that has a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, but not really any omega-3s. So that's why a lot of people who eat tons of fast food, you see a lot more inflammation in those individuals. Okay? And if you're looking at great sources of DHA, again, Atlantic salmon, shrimp, lots of other fish, you can do a quick literature search to find that, and also women's breast milk for breastfeeding. Um, it turns out that babies, infants, when they're very, very young, they have to have adequate DHA because, as we mentioned in another video, DHA is very important in development of the human brain. I've often said this, if somebody calls you a fathead, it's a compliment because the brain is actually hugely lipid. And one of those lipids that actually helps with function is DHA and also EPA. Okay? So, that's another advocation for breastfeeding your child if you can. Helps with brain development because of these omega-3 fatty acids. All right? Now, I want to talk briefly about this figure up here. It looks a little bit confusing. Um, we have over here arachidonic acid. Here's eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, DHA. Now you see these enzymes, COX, which is cyclooxygenase, LOX is lipoxygenase, and you know you just see these enzymes throughout here. We normally think of COXs and LOX enzymes reacting with arachidonic acid. Um, we know that COX can convert arachidonic acid into the parent prostaglandin, an eicosanoid, and lipoxygenases can convert arachidonic acid into leukotrienes. However, these enzymes can also react with EPA and DHA, but the resulting products have usually very different functions. Let's look over at arachidonic acid, our omega-6 fatty acid. Reaction with COX generates prostaglandins, and some of those, in particular PGH2, can be converted to thromboxanes through the enzyme thromboxane synthase. And the vast majority of thromboxanes and prostaglandins are, are pro-inflammatory. The one exception that I'm directly aware of that's not, it's actually, you could call anti-inflammatory, is actually PGI2 or prostacyclin that actually plays a role in preventing platelets from aggregating in the bloodstream during normal conditions. And lipoxygenases give you leukotrienes, which are actually very pro-inflammatory. You see both of these together, generally high pro-inflammatory potential. Now, EPA, reaction with COX and LOX, or cyclooxygenase, lipoxygenase, they can create some mycosinoids with low pro-inflammatory potential, but then sometimes they can actually have anti-inflammatory or inflammation-resolving potential. And then you see DHA. Reaction with cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase generates eicosanoids that are very anti-inflammatory. This is precisely the reason why 
you want to make sure you're getting enough DHA. And if you don't regularly get uh, fish or shrimp, I recommend it at least once a week, you definitely need to consider buying one of these supplements. It'd be very good for you. Not that I'm advertising a product here, I'm advocating health instead. Now, a lot of these molecules down here, we're going to go over some general classes of those in the next videos. And we're going to see that DHA and EPA, but especially DHA, can be converted into some classes of molecules. Resolvins, marisins, and protectins. And all of these combined are actually very anti-inflammatory. And we're just beginning to understand the basics of how these molecules function. So make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you for watching and join us in the next video.